All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, big thanks to Ben Nye, who is our CIO, Chief Investment Officer, but also our Chief Instrumental Officer uh, for that rousing intro music. I can tell some clients enjoyed it more than others, but that was actually a recommendation from yours truly. We appreciate you guys being here. As you can see, we're going to be talking about 2021, the time period ahead. Ben called it the mysterious beyond, uh, much to my chagrin, really wanted it to be into the unknown, but we at least got the music in there. Uh, as always, we appreciate everybody uh, being here. Shameless plugs on the front end. Um, we do daily market commentary uh, via Zoom. If you go to narwhalcapital.com slash briefings, you can find the links there. And we talk about this kind of the big stories. Uh, frankly, it's quite different uh, than this conversation is going to be. This is going to be looking at the big picture as opposed to just topical headlines from the day. But really appreciate everybody being here. Uh, with that out of the way, we'll show you the disclosure uh, all that good stuff. And, you know, as always, this is essentially the warning that these are our opinions. We put a lot of work and effort into this. We're not saying anything we don't believe, but we're not guaranteeing accuracy. The one thing we do guarantee is we'll probably miss something in here. Uh, that's that's going to happen, but uh, we appreciate you being here nonetheless. And uh, really grateful for clients that are engaged, clients that are interested in our content. And I will touch more about that kind of at the end of this presentation. With that out of the way, let's look at where we're going today. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so today we're really going to be looking at a look back at 2020 a little bit, but we don't want to rehash everything that we've talked about before. So we kind of want to look at 2020 as a lesson for what's going to come next. Um, and so I think the temptation was we turned the corner into 2020 was to think that, OK, we're turning the corner into a new year, into a new decade. Things are going to be a lot different. And things are going to be were different, although not the way we thought, probably at the beginning of the year. But I do think in 2021, uh, we actually have arrived at more of an inflection point of change. I think 2021 will mark a sea change in politics, uh, not just the US presidency, um, obviously the Senate, the House of Representatives. Uh, four years ago, the Supreme Court was four versus four. Um, and today, the Democrats have the executive and legislative branches. Conservatives have obviously have a more significant edge in the Supreme Court. Uh, but also four years ago, uh, the, the vote on Brexit was just that previous summer. David Cameron had barely stepped down. Theresa May was negotiating the deal with the European Union. And fast forward four years, and you have Boris Johnson is in charge of now uh, doing all the trade deals. And so that's going to be a huge uh, mark of 2021 because Brexit has been finalized and Britain is out of the UK, uh, out of the European Union for the first time since 1972. So there's a lot to look forward to. And so as we go through the uh, presentation today, uh, we do want to look back at that 2020, the year of the rat, um, and really try to pick up some insights uh, as to what lessons it has for 2021. Um, and then we're gonna, definitely going to be looking to 2021. And I think the theme there is going to be expect the unexpected. I think there's a temptation to say that there's going to be a lot of sereneness. There's going to be a lot of calm and more order. Uh, but as we certainly found out in 2020, uh, things have a tendency of surprising us. And then we'll finally finish by looking at what's going to happen beyond 2021. Because as I mentioned before, there are some things that are in place that can really cast the uh, trajectory of what happens over the next decade and not just a single year. So as we look back into 2020, um, you know, again, as we think back to where we were at the beginning of 2020, uh, Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve said, as late as January 29th, the labor market remains strong and economic activity has been rising at a moderate rate. Clearly, the Federal Reserve did not see what came just a month later uh, when they felt the need to dramatically cut interest rates, uh, dramatically increase bond purchases. They were unprepared, as were the rest of us, quite frankly. And so uh, as we do, that's probably the biggest lesson as we look into 21, is that um, just because people and the experts are saying things are uh, one way does not necessarily mean that will actually uh, come, come to fruition. So as we look into back into 2020, we want to pull out a few insights. First one is going to be supply and demand imbalances. We are going to look at housing. We're going to look at autos. We're going to look at employment, supply and demand for employment, uh, for bonds, and for an, and uh, 
the corresponding effect on inflation. We're going to look at mobility, how much people are moving and how that actually correlates or does not correlate with economic activity. And then I think one of the most overlooked ingredients in terms of market prices is the sentiment of both uh, leaders in business and also investing investors. And then we'll also look back briefly at what markets did. Um, but quickly, I want to get the pitch of the hall, as they say. And so I'm going to share this poll. And the question is, which of these states saw employment actually grow in 2020? We'll answer this question over the course of the um, of the presentation. And uh, we're seeing some votes come in right now. Uh, we're, which of these states saw employment actually grow in 2020? It's a three horse race right now between Florida, Georgia, and Tennessee. We'll give it five, four, three, two, one. And you can see the results. So a dead heat for Georgia and Tennessee um, with Florida coming, uh, coming just behind. So we, we'll see who got it right as we go on. We're gonna start with housing though. So the chart on the left here shows new listings. So essentially supply of housing. The chart on the right shows uh, homes sold. So think of that as demand. And so I think as we look back into 2020, I think the clearest case study in supply and demand dynamics that I can remember is what was in housing. So as you look back as to see what happened, you see, saw new listings drop 40% versus historical averages. Home sales only dropped 30%. So what this means is that we actually uh, created a dramatic shortage of supply of housing that we haven't really caught up with. And uh, as that persisted over the course of the year, we continued to be short on housing, which has an influence on prices. So you can see the supply on the left-hand side and the demand on the right-hand side. And this chart may actually show it a little bit better. You see the normal seasonal patterns with uh, supply, new listings leading the actual sale of the homes, which makes sense. And that happened in 2018, it happened in 2019, and it was starting to happen in 2020. But in March and April, when things shut down, that supply really fell off. And so although supplies come back, it's not quite to where it was either in 2018 or 2019. But if you look at the blue line, the blue line is above where it was in 2018 and 2019. So when you have demand higher than normal, even just a little bit, and supply significantly lower, because remember, we still have to make up for all that lost ground in March and April. Uh, this is a recipe for home selling quickly and home selling at higher prices. And so the chart on the left is again, uh, using Redfin data. Um, we can see that uh, fully 40% of homes even now are coming off market in two weeks. And this results in higher prices. They're getting the prices they want and they're able to price them higher. And so price, home prices are actually up 14%, which kind of boggles people's minds, but in a recession that home prices are up so much. But again, this is the classic low supply, moderate demand, moderate to strong demand. And that's creating that shortage and uh, mismatch in supply and demand in the housing market. If we look in the autos, it's a similar story. Uh, so when things shut down in the spring months, uh, production fell to basically zero in North America and demand fell as well, but again, not as much as production. And so although in the months more recently, production has matched supply, think of all that production that we didn't get in March, April, and May that we now have to make up for. And so this has the same effect on prices, as you can see here. This is the index of used car prices, the Mannheim used car value index. And uh, that went from 140 before the pandemic to 160 after the pandemic. So that's about a 10 to 15% increase in used car prices. Um, again, these are not new car prices, but that's because new car prices are not, uh, they weren't able to supply as many new cars. And uh, so we see tight supply in housing, tight supply in autos, and that's gonna take some time to reconcile. But it wasn't just housing in autos, it was also in uh, beer, computer chips, um, 
and a host of other places. So Constellation Brands is a company that we follow fairly closely. Uh, they are the marketer of Modelo, Corona, um, Pacifico, and uh, a few, couple wine brands. Um, but basically in Mexico, their production was taken out in April and May. And they're still making up for lost time. They haven't resupplied and restocked yet. And they don't expect to get to a point where their inventories are about in balance until February, almost a full year after the pandemic hit. Uh, same thing is true in uh, semiconductors and computer chips. Um, and you wouldn't really think necessarily about computer chips having an impact on autos, but what we're seeing right now is Volkswagen, uh, Daimler, and some other companies are all having to cut automotive production because they don't have the electronic components that go in a lot of their vehicles. And so when we talk about supply and demand dynamics, it doesn't necessarily even just uh, fit that single commodity like housing or autos or beer. It also can have ripple effects up and down the supply chain. And this is reconciling, but we're still in the process of reconciliation. And a lot of these companies and a lot of these areas may not reconcile until February in the case of uh, Constellation Brands. And if you're talking about housing, it may not reconcile for a year or two. And this had impacts on uh, technology spending. Um, interestingly, this is just a interesting factoid on the ability to sell technology. Uh, there were a lot of free trials in 2021. So you actually saw lower revenue growth, but there's gonna be higher revenue growth as we look out into 2021, because a lot of those free trials will end up turning into paying subscribers over time. Um, so that's kind of the commodity side. If we shift to employment. So let's talk a little bit about supply and demand employment growth by state now. Everyone kind of did this poll earlier. Tennessee is the one that actually grew employment. Uh, it was joined by Alaska. And the big takeaway from this is that this was not your typical recession where everything kind of goes down. Is in 2008, maybe Florida got hit a little bit harder, but everywhere got hit. Um, in this recession, what we saw was places like Massachusetts lost more than 10% of its labor force where Places like Tennessee, Alaska actually grew its labor force. On the chart, you have labeled the four largest states by population and uh, Georgia, and you can kind of see the trends uh, there too. Um, as just as a side note, from a political perspective, it actually is, uh, is interesting because it makes sense that uh, many Democrats favor more state and local aid. Because if you look toward the right side of the chart uh, and look at some of the states that are mentioned there, a lot of those states tend to be a little bit more Democrat. Um, and so they're trying to do the right thing by their constituents and advocate for more state and local aid. And the states to the left hand side of the chart are trying to do the right things for their constituents and said, hey, we're not actually getting, we're getting hit, but not really that hard. We don't need to do a ton of money to the state and local, uh, lo local governments. So that's just kind of an interesting case study in uh, employment growth as it relates by a state by state basis. In terms of employment growth by sector, um, the federal government was the only sector of the economy that actually grew the employed population in 2020. Uh, leisure and hospitality was obviously a big loser. Um, I don't think we're too surprised by that. But what's really interesting here is that some of the non historically cyclical sectors, things like transportation, things like construction, even retail, actually got hit less badly than things that you typically look as, at, as very safe places of employment. Think about state government, education, healthcare. You don't expect those sectors to lose more jobs than transportation, construction, and retail. And uh, we're gonna do another poll here because we're gonna go back uh, a, um, all the way back to 2013 now. And we want to see what sector has experienced the greatest amount of employment growth from 2013 to 2020. What sector employs the most people on a percentage basis today than back in 2013? We'll give There's it some people on this call that should definitely get this question right. <laughs>
You're at five seconds, four, three, two, one. I'm gonna end and share. And uh, yeah, the eyes have it. Construction. Uh, so you guys know your stuff. Um, but construction, uh, which 79% of you got correct, has actually grown employment by 3.8% per year, including this last year, uh, since 2013. Um, and this is relative to population growth of about 0.6%. So I think this is just very interesting because if you want to go where the jobs are, the jobs are in construction. Um, for perspective, educational services has grown 0.18%. Uh, local government has declined, information sector has declined, and leisure and hospitality, which is obviously imp impacted by this last year, has also declined. So that's where the demand for work is right now. In terms of overall employment numbers, uh, employment growth has tapered. Uh, we had that strong rebound initially, um, and it's tapered a little bit off now as uh, People have changed their habits. There's less need for servers when people are purchasing takeout rather than dine-in. Um, so we've recovered about 60% of those lost jobs, um, which in the space of a year is actually not too bad, although we need that progress to continue. Contrast that with 2008, where it took us, first of all, it took us about two years to reach the bottom. And then it took us another two years to recover half the jobs. So to do it all in the space of one year is dramatically, dramatically faster than uh, was accomplished in 2008. But what's interesting is that a lot of the lack of recent employment growth is due more to a shortage of labor supply rather than a shortage of labor demand. So um, I actually found an interesting article on Wisconsin Public Radio, and we're going to post all these with the notes and the resources uh, after, following the presentation. But they really pointed to four reasons that there is this labor shortage right now. First one is a skill mismatch. So they say, you know, if, if someone's a restaurant chef or a restaurant manager, they can't just decide they're going to flip over and become a welder or a plumber. They need to be experienced in that. So they have a skill mismatch there that makes them unsuited for the jobs that they could get. There could be a geographic mismatch. Um, so for instance, Massachusetts, which has uh, lost a lot of jobs, uh, if you wanna go to where the jobs are, say in Tennessee, you'd have to move to Tennessee. And so those geographic mismatches cause some of the uh, labor shortages as well. You could have a pay mismatch. So the pay at the open jobs may not justify the commute. Um, housing close by may be too expensive. And there may be a safety mismatch. So someone's perception of safety uh, may be different than what the job can offer. So where remote work and social distancing is less possible. So they use in this article, they use uh, the example of processing facilities. Some of the prospective employees may not feel comfortable taking the work there. Another example is retail. Um, do people feel comfortable taking a job at 10, $12 an hour uh, and exposing themselves to uh, COVID. So I think those are, those are interesting things to think about when we're thinking about the problem uh, with our labor force right now and why some of those employment numbers have tapered off. And uh, we do have that lack of supply. In terms of demand, it's okay. I mean, it, it's not gangbusters. I mean, it isn't fantastic, but it's okay. Uh, so, so right now we have a shortage of supply and okay demand. Um, so it's not like demand is driving uh, what's going ahead, but this shortage of supply is really the driving factor right now. So as you can see here, uh, as some of these uh, executives characterize their business, they talk about uh, business, con business conditions being steady or stable. It's good, all things considered. Starting to see demand weakening, um, but looking to see business resume in the late first quarter. Um, slightly above pre-COVID. So things are okay, but they're not fantastic in terms of the demand side. Regardless, when you talk about okay demand and low supply, it means higher wages. And wages are up about 5% uh, versus last year. Again, you would not necessarily expect this 
in a recession, but that's what's happening. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there on a, the employment side and hand it off to Tom here to talk a little bit about what we're seeing on in the bond side. So to start off, I think it's important to look at what the bond market looked like in 2019. And so if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that across the major sectors of the U.S. bond market, in 2019, we issued about $8.2 trillion in new debt. Uh, a lot of that was refinancing old debt and you know, a lot of it is new mortgages, but that's about the level we were at. And it wasn't, historically speaking, uh, a blockbuster year for new issuance. Uh, and if you look on the right, we had about a 50% increase in new issuances of bonds this year. Uh, and a lot of that came from the corporate space. A ton of it came in the treasury space. Uh, specifically, you know, we raised all that money for the uh, stimulus checks and all of the, the new buying the Fed's doing in order to keep rates low. Um, and there's a couple of read-throughs here that I think are very interesting because if you look at the very bottom of that chart, uh, you can see the muni bond market, which is where about 90% of the bonds that we own as a firm uh, for clients exist. And there's you know, a 50% increase across the entire market, but the muni bond sector only increased by about 15%. And there's some interesting read-throughs there because if you think about holding bonds, a lot of people think of them as investments like stocks, but in reality, what you have is you're essentially the creditor to a company or someone who owns their mortgage uh, or a local municipality. So you have to look at it in terms of, you know, what's the credit quality of this person? Uh, you know, are they uh, paying me enough to lend them my money for a certain period of time? And it's really interesting because we had such huge issuance in corporate bonds, but at the same time, the yields that they're paying are historically low. And so if I'm out there looking to give my money to someone and get uh, a return on that investment, right now, if you look at something like AT&T, which is the most heavily indebted US company, uh, a five-year bond for AT&T, which is triple B, about as vanilla and normal as a corporate bond could be, you're getting paid about 0.22% for a five-year hold. Uh, if you look at a five-year treasury, you know, you're not getting much more than that, but it's about the same. Uh, and if you look at municipal bonds, while the yields aren't, you know, extraordinary, you're getting, you know, one, one and a half, sometimes 2% on that, you're getting that tax-free kicker, as well as the credit quality is much higher. Uh, you're basically saying, you know, I'm, I'm betting on the average person to, you know, pay their taxes, pay their water bill, uh, and in return, I'm getting a little bit more than I would on a treasury or a corporate. And so that's the area we think in terms of, you know, what are the, if we're looking at people who would lend our money to the municipal bond space, you know, as a, uh, as a creditor is where we would like to be the most, uh, especially as uh, prices are getting higher and higher and the number of outstanding bonds are getting worse and worse. It's essentially like giving your money to a guy so he can go buy his third lake house uh, and in exchange, he's going to pay you about 0.22% a year. Uh, you know, it's just companies are as levered as, as they've ever been and yet your return on investment is as low as it's ever been. And so that's an area we're really avoiding uh, at all costs. In fact, today we were selling about as many corporate positions as we could and replacing them with, uh, with municipals and taxable municipals, uh, given the way the rates are starting to move. So here's an even further uh, drill down and why we think munis are the place to be in 2021. Uh, so if you look at last year, 2019, there was about $400 billion in new municipal bonds issued and in 2020, uh, we had $470 uh, billion dollars issued. But if you look at that top line, the biggest space in munis that's increasing is taxable munis. And the reason for that is the most recent tax changes made it so uh, state and local governments were unable to refinance their debt uh, until it was within 90 days of, uh, of its next call date. And so previously, you, know, you could have a 5% municipal bond that matures in 2030, you know, you could refinance that with a new bond paying 1% and move on, refinance it, kind of like refinancing a house. And you can't do that now. Uh, so what they're doing as a workaround is they're refinancing those bonds with taxable municipals, which are, you know, the same, same credit worthiness, they're the same cash flows, but the difference is you don't get that tax exempt status. And so, in fact, in a year where the bond market at large has expanded by 50% in terms of issuance, municipal bonds have actually become more scarce on the tax exempt side. And so we think, you know, if you're getting say 300 times what you would get uh, in a treasury, plus you're getting that tax exempt status, plus it's a shrinking market, you know, we think in terms of where we want to place our money uh, on the fixed income side, we still think that's the best bang for your buck. And tax bills, while they are increasing uh, significantly in terms of where they are uh, in the marketplace, it's one of the smallest areas of the market. Uh, there really were no taxable bonds before 2009. There was the Build America program. 
uh, where they issued a ton of partially funded by state government, partially funded by federal government bonds that were taxable in order to stimulate the economy back in 2009. And since then, they've kind of fallen away. But with these new tax changes in 2018, they've become a growing area. And we think in terms of where you can place those, like IRAs uh, and, and tax money uh, that is, is sheltered, like Roths, we think for bang for your buck, we'd much rather have taxable munis, which have a default rate of 0.01% versus a corporate that has a, ta- a default rate of roughly 4 or 5%. Uh, on comparable credit quality, uh, and you're getting more bang for your buck. You're getting probably about six times the yield on a taxable muni that you would on a corporate right now. But going back to the Fed, uh, you know, looking forward, this is uh, this is basically what they were prognosticating at the beginning of 2019. So the Fed was basically saying, you know, we've hiked rates, uh, we're getting back to normal levels, and we don't foresee any more tightening of monetary policy. Uh, they were basically saying, you know, if we raise rates any more, it might disrupt the economy. We might get in a bad spot. And so their projection was that there was going to be no change to monetary policy in, 2009, in 2020. Uh, and so on the next slide, we can see that that turned out to be completely false. Uh, and so when COVID hit, the Fed basically turned on the money printing machine. They dropped rates to zero. And you know, just one year away, now they're saying the rates are going to be flat uh, and there are going to be no raises in 2000, until 2023. Um, and there's been a little bit of chatter from the Fed over the last couple of weeks. There's some uh, uh, Fed uh, presidents from different cities who are saying that you know, there's potential for 2021 to be a banner year for the economy, and that there's some potential that they're going to uh, slow asset purchases and potentially raise towards the end of 21. Uh, but in terms of Jay Powell and, and his messaging, that doesn't seem to be the case. So right now, this is what we have to, to work with. You know, they always say, don't fight the Fed. Uh, so we're not going to be making trades that directly uh, contradict what the Fed is saying in terms of what they're going to do. But, you know, as the last chart shows, the Fed is not a great indicator of, uh, of the future. They're not, uh, you know, looking at a crystal ball and, and seeing the future. And so we have to continue to be as diligent as possible when it comes to buying bonds. So this chart is essentially an indicator of how uh, loose monetary policy is historically where we are now versus past. And you can see uh, at the beginning of 2020, like we we're talking about in previous slides, the Fed had increased rates. We were starting to see tightening of monetary policy. Uh, and since then, we basically reached a new high. The faucet is fully open and the Fed is uh, flooding the money with the market with money. They're buying uh, $120 billion in assets a month, which is split $80 billion, uh, $80 billion in treasuries and $40 billion in mortgage backs. Uh, and there really is no end in sight that we can see on that. So, you know, for the foreseeable future, monetary policy is going to be as lax as it ever has been historically. And here you can see where we, uh, the 10 years typically considered the, uh, the cornerstone of, of the safety trade uh, in the bond space. And so you can see the 10 year treasury fell to all time lows back in the middle of 2020. Uh, and we've since seen that sort of, uh, We've seen a little bit of a release there, especially over the last couple of weeks. And so I would expect that co- to continue. Uh, this morning, the 10-year treasury got uh, even higher than posted on this, uh, this chart. It got all the way up to about 1.18%. And the 30-year treasury got right up to about 2%. Uh, there was a very strong 10-year uh, bond auction today, which actually uh, stopped the bleeding just a little bit today. We saw a little bit of retracement there. But given the fact that there's about $7.7 trillion in treasuries that are going to mature this year and need to be uh, refinanced and new bonds need to be issued to pay those off and we can kick the can down the road, uh, the amount of demand is really going to be important this year if we're going to see rates stay low. We're going to have to have uh, just huge issuance across the board. We're going to have to have large issuance further down the curve out 10, 20 years in order to uh, alleviate some of the short-term need for treasuries. And so it would be my expectation that, that barring some sort of uh, exogenous shock, like another round of COVID, uh, the interest rates are going to continue to tick higher over the next year. And here, this is an interesting chart. So this is the spread between high yield securities and, uh, and their comparable uh, treasuries. So basically, this chart shows you how much people need to be paid to buy a sub-investment grade bond uh, in order to feel comfortable with it. So you can see you know, back in early 2020, people were really staying away from high yield credits. They were thinking, you know, I'm not getting paid enough to go way down the credit ladder uh, and start picking up junk bonds. So it was almost 11% is the amount of uh, extra yield you would need in order to stay 
uh, in an area where people felt comfortable and felt they were being compensated uh, for taking credit risk. And what we saw throughout COVID is actually, even though we had a banner year for bankruptcies, you know, we had everything from Brooks Brothers to California Pizza Kitchen, pretty much anything involving a mall uh, or any place I would have gone on a date in my teens, uh, go bankrupt, Bud Ruckers. Uh, we saw that a lot of companies in that triple B space, or sorry, double B space and below, did very well. They managed their debt and balance sheets and they became very creative in their way of refinancing debt. We saw a lot of floating rate and convertible paper come to the market, which is pretty unusual. Um, and as a result, people feel far more comfortable there. And not only that, the demand for yield increased significantly as treasuries dropped, as, as municipal bond yields dropped, people started buying up these, uh, these lower grade credits. And so right now we're all the way down to about 3% on high yield bonds. So while there is, are some opportunities there, that's also a stay away. We think that you're just not getting compensated enough for the amount of credit risk you're, uh, you're looking for in that space. Yeah, and I think also the degree to which the federal fiscal and monetary response is actually really backstopped a lot of these high yield bonds. I think that really boosted confidence. And I think it also had an impact on uh, some of the economic output that we had. Uh, you can see on this chart, actually, uh, the black line is where expectations are now. The, uh, the green dotted line, which is at the very bottom, if you looked at the, at the all the way out to Q4 2021, uh, that was where expectations were in April. And so what we can see is, you know, we're now expected to reach our prior level of economic output uh, about the middle of point of this year. Uh, but original expectations were that we'd still be 5% below it. Now, 5% doesn't may not sound like a lot, but uh, when you talk about a $20 trillion, $25 trillion economy, uh, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of, that's a lot of economic output that would be missed. So uh, things have rebounded a little bit faster than expected. Um, but the path forward had, is now about as constant as it has been that that so the slope of that black line is now about even with where it was uh, ex projected to be uh, in the other quarters. So I want to talk a little bit more about mobility um, because that's been a huge theme of 2020 and I think it'll be a theme going forward. I think the big thing when we're talking about mobility is what did COVID cases do and how does that impact mobility and how does that impact the economy? So here's the chart of COVID cases. Uh, clearly we're higher than we were in the summer wave, which was itself higher than we were in the spring wave. Um, this is also backed up by the data we see from hospitalizations. What we can see is that it actually does have an impact on mobility. Um, when you have state mandated lockdowns, obviously, uh, you know, you're not going to descend all the way to the depths that we were back in April. Um, but when we did have that summer wave, we paused out in terms of the reopening. Uh, you can see that in the summer. And then uh, more recently, um, with this with this newest wave, we've really started to retrench a little bit in mobility. Um, and that has an impact on where consumers spend money. So we did analysis of how of retail sales based on uh, census data on how people spend their money. And so we just assumed a consumer budget of $100. Where would they spend that money? What was interesting is that it didn't actually decline all that much in 2020, but it did shift. So people spent more uh, grocery stores, that's the food and beverage stores, but they spent less at gasoline stations. They spent more at online retailers like Amazon, but they spent less money dining out. And I think the thing is, as, as we look in for investment opportunities in 2021, we have to figure out what, which of these is permanent, which of these is transitory in a one-time deal. And so if we look on this chart, um, we actually have this, this blue line of food and beverage stores. Um, this is the best year of growth for grocery stores that we've really ever seen in, in my data. My data goes back to 1994. Um, and so that's unlikely to repeat. In fact, it may actually reverse a little bit as it has a tougher comparison. And so the implication of that is that uh, when you're looking at some of these stocks, things like Kroger, is that uh, you're, you're not gonna see that stock continue to rise. In fact, it's already kind of topped out as people 
have, have expected this. But then if you look at non-store retailers, we could be in a new paradigm shift for non-store retailers. So maybe non-store retail is more of a permanent uh, trend and maybe this food and beverage is gonna start to decline a little bit more. And you can see that also in the Costco numbers. Costco reports numbers every month um, in terms of its comparable sales per store. And what we can see is we've started to decline over the last couple of months. And that's really been driven, if you look at the categories there at the bottom, by food and sundries and fresh foods. Uh, hard lines, things like electronics and furniture, and soft lines, things like apparel, actually continue to perform fairly well. It's really the food that's turned the corner. So again, there are going to be winners and there are going to be losers. And I think uh, the big thing to monitor going forward is which ones are the permanent beneficiaries and which ones were the one-time beneficiaries. So the one-time beneficiaries, that would be a head fake and you want to avoid that. And so the third ingredient here, so we've talked a little bit about the economy, we've talked a little bit about where we're going. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about sentiment. Um, I'm actually going to give another poll uh, here um, about CEO confidence. So CEO confidence rose in every industry except what? Got construction, government nonprofit sector, financial services sector, transportation sector, or healthcare. Uh, so this compares it to last year. All right, we'll pause it there. And uh, survey says financial services, 41% of the vote. So um, let's see what the answer was. And it is financial services. Financial services actually became less confident in this year. Um, went from 6.1 to an index value of 5.8 uh, in December 2020. Interestingly, the most confident uh, if you are in the government or nonprofit space, you are more confident than any other uh, CEO in any other sector. Yeah, and I'll jump in here, Ben. Um, you know, perhaps this is a warning against listening to people that work in financial services, but CEO confidence, uh, very low from financial services, as you can see. Interestingly enough, uh, financial services were the second best performing sector in terms of employment in 2020. They barely dipped. Uh, we talked about this earlier. Uh, federal government actually grew. They were the only class to actually grow, but financial services barely dipped. Uh, and also financial services uh, solidly in the top five sectors in terms of growth since 2013. So a uh, little bit willy nilly there. They're hiring a lot of people. They're not laying off many people when things get tight. And now maybe they're panicking a little bit. Indeed. Um, and then overall, you can see the CEO confidence obviously dipped significantly in April, May, uh, rebounded, dipped again in November with the uh, political machinations and COVID, uh, but have since uh, picked right back up in December. And if we look at where people are confident about, it's hiring. Um, in fact, hiring has been in a pretty positive trend and expectations for hiring is actually even higher today than it was pre-pandemic. So that's good news as we look to close that gap in employment. Again, that a lot of that's gonna be a function of labor supply who actually wants to work these jobs. And the other aspect is, you know, people are gonna, CEOs are projecting significant increases in capital expenditures over the next 12 months, which would be a positive as well. Um, the other place where you can see where this uh, CEO confidence manifests itself is in mergers and acquisitions activity. M&A deal count uh, was for Q4 was the strongest Q4 ever. Um, in terms of dollar value, it wasn't quite there. And in admittedly in Q4, we were making up for lost time because there was a lot of lost time in Q2. But the big takeaway here is that CEOs are confident enough in where they are and where the economy is going that they're making, that they're doing deals, the sentiment is, sentiment is relatively strong. Sentiment's also strong in the investing side. Um, you can see we hit an all time low on this Merrill Lynch bull bear indicator of 0, 0.0 back in March, uh, which was a great buying signal. And then uh, right now we're at about 7.1. So we're fairly elevated. Um, and uh, you know, if you, we're not at extreme levels yet, but we're 
getting closer. And so I think this is something to bear in mind because although the economy may be improving, that sentiment front runs things a little bit too much, you could have a market correction even while the economy moves, continues to move forward. Um, so let's give uh, one more poll here. So the S&P returned what percentage in 2020? Here's a litmus test, folks, if you've been paying attention. I know mid-year people were shocked to see that stocks had come back. Um, have you been watching? Have you been listening to the morning calls? This is a pop quiz. We're going to kick you out if you don't get this right. 18.4%. All right. We've got some people that need to leave the chat now, um, but we appreciate you being here. No, market closed up 18.4% uh, uh, for the year. So, you know, shockingly a pretty strong year. Uh, for stocks. So, you know, we're obviously pretty grateful for that, especially given where we were nine months ago. As we looked at the individual sectors, I think this is pretty interesting. We talked on our Q1 uh, 2020 recap call about energy a little bit. And we made the comment on that macro call that, you know, the performance of energy and the blow that the price of oil took, that alone in some years would be the major headline. And yet that's Obviously a factor, but somewhat lost in the wind in terms of everything that happened in 2020 between obviously COVID-19, the election, political strife, social justice, all those things. People seem to have just kind of overlooked that, but that was the worst performing sector. Interestingly enough, for such a volatile year, we really saw growth oriented stocks benefit. You can see that on a sector level here. Information technology performed very well, up nearly 30%. Communication services up more than 20 uh, so kind of an interesting period in which there was so much volatility. I think we will all at some point look back at 2020 and think of the damage done uh, specifically in March of that year. And yet high flying sectors really showed uh, to be the outperformers for the year. And you really see that on the value versus growth comparison. We talk about this often. Uh, S&P growth. So the growth oriented companies as defined by valuation metrics. We're up 33.5% for the calendar year of 2020. Value stocks only up 1.4. This is right on the heels of another odd year. You know, 2019 market up more than 30%. You would think growth stocks would crush value stocks in that period, but that wasn't the case. Value actually did slightly better. But uh, certainly a challenging environment given that, again, when you think of heightened heightened volatility, you tend to think of more value-oriented companies doing well but that. There's one the case in 2020, and you'll also see that on this next slide, uh, kind of through major indices and major benchmarks. The NASDAQ, which tends to be more growth oriented, up nearly more than 45%. The S&P, as we've said already, up 18.4. The Dow, kind of your big, massive blue chip companies, uh, only, quote unquote, up 9.7%. Still a you know very solid return, but lots of differentiation there. And you can see, even in that harsh, harsh sell-off from late February into late March. Uh, even in that period, the NASDAQ outperformed. I mean, it was the running joke around the office. You know, will we live to see a day in which the Dow ever outperforms the NASDAQ? And eventually we saw it, but it was a long time wait. That's really, you know, as we transition more to looking ahead, 2020 in a nutshell. I mean, there's so many things. We've said it over and over on these calls in the mornings at 8.30. We've said it, you know, kind of as we're talking about an office, it felt like there were so many periods where it felt like multiple years. You know, the, the election in November feels like it was a decade ago in terms of the news cycle and all the information we're trying to process on the market side. But when we look at the themes, I think these are things that we really do need, need to be mindful of in terms of what happened in 2020. The biggest uh, and the first thing we talked about was su supply chain disruption. Uh, there was uncertain demand and that created tons of volatility not just in February, not just in March, but throughout the year. Uh, the markets are working on the assumption pretty clearly that the Federal Reserve and the federal government will emerge as buyers. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the presentation. But at least in the short term, that assumption has been proven correct. Uh, and really seeing just varied market reactions compared to what we've seen historically, especially in a down market. As we look ahead to 2021, uh, we'd be remiss to not reference St. Anthony Fauci. Uh, he says, we hope by the time we get to April, we'll be able to have what we call, quote, open season. Uh, I think he probably would have said that a year ago, 
I think there's more cause for optimism knowing what we know now with the vaccines and things like that, that maybe that will be a reality. And that's certainly the assumption that I think the market's making. You know, we were kind of hoping that the market would close at all time highs today just so we could pay, play our all time high playlist uh, before the music, uh, the presentation started. But that's where we are. And we're basically sitting right at those. The market is assuming that things are coming back and they're coming back perhaps quicker than expected previously. But I want to caution everybody, uh, the consensus view is very rarely accurate. We talked about this a year ago in terms of this chart on the left side of your screen from Merrill Lynch. The expectation was that profits were going to rally, that we were going to see you know, yield curves show signs of growth, and we were going to see more optimism going into the market after a 2020 that saw a great market return, but so-so economic results. The expectation was real strength going into 2020, and that just was not the case. I mean, you can see this uh, already dated article from about eight months ago, a top economist saying that the 1930s depression was great. This one might be even greater. And again, that expert opinion hasn't really fleshed out, at least not in terms of the short-term recovery that we've seen here in the U.S. and abroad. Vaccines, uh, I think we got to take a minute and just recognize, you know, something that clearly was not on the radar a year ago and certainly a signs at the time, which is just the strength of technology in the current day, the strength of medicine. Uh, you can see here the various uh, companies that have entered uh, the virus lottery, so to speak. You can see the country of origin and all of this stuff will be posted on the blog later so you can come back and reference it. But uh, there were a lot of naysayers in terms of the vaccine. I was skeptical. I think many people were skeptical because it was just so unheard of to roll out something at this pace with any degree of efficacy. And yet here we are. And you know, we've seen now the criticisms on the vaccines really morph. You know, people that said the vaccine would not be available by the end of calendar year 2020 were upset that not enough people were getting it by the end of 2020. Now they're upset that people may not get their second dose when they wanted to in 2021. But the fact remains something that very, very few people had optimism for has come to fruition. Uh, and so that's, again, you know, something that's very unique to this era in terms of being able to see these things roll out, roll out quickly. Credit to the companies that did it. Credit to the uh, federal agencies that supported them, that funded them, that, you know, lacks controls to some degree to get something out. And really, you know, that had an impact on the economy. We're going to talk about, you know, the money flow from central banks and things like that at length in this presentation. But we also need to recognize that some of the optimism in the economy is coming from the vaccine side. All right, we got another poll. So uh, really interested to see what people say on this. Um, individual tax rates, will they change? If so, will it be in 2021 or 2022? Or do you think we're not going to see a tax rate change? Obviously, tax rates a huge talking point uh, when it comes to elections. We heard lots about it, whether it was about the rate that Trump paid or what he should have paid and whether it was about Biden raising this and not raising that. Uh, but what's your expectation? What are you seeing right now? We'll give you about three more seconds. All right. We got the results. Uh, the majority saying yes in 2022. Uh, some people saying yes in 2021. Nobody saying no. Um, you know, not to be a crowd follower, but I tend to agree with the consensus there. Um, I think this is probably something we're going to be tackling into 2022 as opposed to 2021. We'll touch on that in a moment. But uh, where we stand right now in terms of the federal government, uh, the House closed slightly in terms of the Republicans winning some seats that they were not expected to. So right now there's basically a 222 to 211 lead uh, for the Democrats. The Senate is 50-50, and I think this is an important distinction to make. I think people are talking about the Senate as if it is 51-50, with Vice President Kamala Harris being the tie-breaking vote. We need to understand that she comes into play if and only if there's a true 50-50 tie. Um, you know, obviously, political leanings being what they may, there's going to be a lot of votes where that may happen, but I don't think we should assume that that's going to be every vote. I don't think we're going to see every vote come down to people voting specifically just on their party line. Uh, I know that's not what Biden is hoping for. Uh, and so, you know, yes, the Democrats hold the advantage there because of her position as vice president. But Again, be cognizant that that's not necessarily going to be every single issue. Obviously, Joe Biden is the president-elect. He's going to take office here in just a couple of days. If you are hearing this for the first time from me, I would highly encourage you 
Um, maybe to get back on cable news or, you know, start listening to our morning briefings or something like that. That's a reality. We've known that for months at this point. Uh, but we do have a Supreme Court that's going to provide some checking. Uh, it shades towards the conservative side by about a five to three to one margin. So that's kind of where we stand on the federal level. 2021 wise, part of why I don't think we're going to see huge tax reform this calendar year is that there's just bigger fish to fry. Uh, obviously, the number one priority is going to be COVID-19 and the stimulus. When you look at why people vote and how they voted, if you combine the economy with COVID-19 handling from a political standpoint, that's the majority of why people voted why the way that they voted. So we're going to see COVID-19 addressed in a way that helps the economy, at least in the short term. We're looking for $2,000 checks. We're looking for extended unemployment. Uh, we're looking for more information on how vaccines are distributed, all of that stuff. Uh, obviously, there's going to be the challenge of addressing the 2022 budget, uh, addressing the National Defense Authorization Act. And I think health care is probably higher on the priority list even in tax legislation. We heard so much about health care in the debates as we have really for the last you know, eight or 12 years. I think they'll continue to come after drug prices. Trump made some headway on that, at least with some of the bigger name drugs, things like insulin. Uh, but I think they're going to continue to go there. I think there'll be somewhat bipartisan support uh, in limiting surprise billing. Telehealth, I think, will be at the forefront in terms of trying to figure out how to make health care more cost effective, uh, both for private payers and those on Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, and then Medicaid expansion seems pretty likely to be on the docket. Other elements, immigration reform, Voting Rights Act amendments, I think we're going to see that addressed both at a federal level and a local level. I think states are going to be really rethinking what happened in the 2020 election, not because they question the results, at least not with any degree of high integrity, but because they want to make sure their constituents are happy. Uh, so I think I would be looking for lots of state level changes in terms of how people vote, when they vote, what they need to vote, things like that. And minimum wage is something that I wouldn't have thought necessarily a year ago would be getting this much support from the ground level. But I think there's going to be a lot of support for revisiting the minimum wage, uh, possibly to $15 an hour, certainly higher than $7.25 an hour. I think when we look at the labor shortages, and we touched on this earlier, people don't want to take an $8 an hour job to go work in the service industry or to go work somewhere where they might contract COVID or frankly anything. Uh, I think they're looking at this and saying, is it worth it? So I think there's probably going to be slightly more support for a minimum wage increase at a political level than there has been uh, in previous periods. I think previously it seemed like a feel good, that would be nice talking point with a vast array of known but unintended consequences. I think people are going to overlook uh, some of their short term concerns uh, in exchange for bringing a short-term benefit. Yeah, so I think that's, that's a good summary of the political front. Um, as we look at what the consensus is on the employment front, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at the employment, inflation, uh, bonds, and the markets really quickly here. So here's the consensus. Um, is, you know, is it a straight line of 320,000 jobs, new jobs a month? That's what the economists are saying. Um, I think practical experience uh, suggests that it's not going to be in such a straight line. Um, and you have seen that taper off relatively recently. I think one potential scenario is that that taper continues for a couple months. And then uh, we have a little bit of an inflection as uh, the vaccine comes through. And then again, a little bit of a taper into the back half of the year. So I think that could be a potential scenario as well. But the basic point here is that we're moving in the right direction in terms of employment. Uh, we have had a little bit of a taper recently, um, but demand, as demand is relatively moderate and uh, as we do have that limited supply of labor, I do think that those people will ultimately come back into the labor force and start working again. So I, I do think that it's positive for employment, but how that plays out on a month to month basis, I think is uh, really anyone's guess right now. So the economists just draw a straight line th right through it. Uh, if we look at inflation, this is a big topic of debate right now in the uh, financial community. Um, we're seeing corn prices that is that are as high as they've been in many years. Uh, you're seeing gasoline prices that are starting to rise again, and you're seeing soybean prices that are as high as they've ever been. So um, 
the thinking is that this inflation in commodities is going to create higher inflation throughout the economy. However, if you strip out food and energy inflation, which is what the Federal Reserve does, you get something that looks a little bit more like this. And the white line is that core personal consumption expenditure inflation number. So that's a fancy word of saying no food, no energy. What does price inflation look like? And it's actually going the opposite way. This is a huge uh, point of contention in the Federal Reserve right now because uh, what they're seeing, they like to look at this core inflation because they say that food and energy and commodities go back and forth. So they're looking at this and they're basically saying there's not really that much inflation. In fact, there could be a little bit of disinflation going on. And this has to get reconciled somehow. Uh, so expert Tom. What do you got? Yeah, so you know, for a little insight, I spent way too much of my time digging into what Jay Powell says, but back in December, he had a press conference and someone posed the question that, you know, what if there's so much pent up demand for travel and entertainment and services that once that gets back online, is that going to cause massive inflation? Because, you know, we talked about it earlier, oil prices basically dropped to zero back in March. Uh, isn't that going to cause inflation to tick up much faster? You know, oil prices are going to go up, people are going to be traveling, people are going to be spending money in those areas where they hadn't. And his resp response was essentially, no. Uh, he said, you know, that's transient moves in, in price levels. It's not sustained inflation over time. And so, you know, in terms of his vision of, of inflation, those aren't going to be things that move the needle. Uh, and so with the new, you know, floating target for inflation, uh, you know, we really have a lot of work to do and it's going to take some time. And, you know, they even said they don't even expect inflation to get over 2% for some time, but their goal is to get it significantly above that. And so uh, what's going to cause that? It's, it's tough to say. There's been so much money pumped in the economy. It's a shock that we haven't seen hyperinflation, uh, but there's just, you know, it's just not coming to the forefront. And I think that's just a result of all of the, uh, the concert of monetary policy across the globe. So what does the consensus look like in general in the fixed income space, just to kind of put a button on this whole, you know, what does 2021 look like? Uh, so what we're seeing is that there's no indicator there's going to be Fed rate hikes, you know, outside of, of Paul Harker saying that maybe at the end of 2021, uh, you know, the Philadelphia Fed chief saying that, you know, there's a possibility for that. I don't think that's the case. I think in terms of how Powell's thinking, he wants to keep it lower for longer, as accommodative as possible uh, for the foreseeable future. In terms of the 10-year, the consensus view around investment banks and, and Wall Street is that we're going to get to about 1.2 on the 10-year. I think that's a little low. We almost got there today. Uh, you know, we had that strong uh, treasury auction that we talked about that pushed rates back down at about 1.13. But, you know, we basically got there uh, for about 25 minutes today before the auction. So I, it would be in my expectation that that number is a little low, but that seems to be the consensus around the street right now. Uh, in terms of new home sales, we're going to see a huge increase there, uh, and existing home sales is the same. I think the, the the secular trend here from COVID is that people are moving away from major cities. They're looking for bigger houses. If they're going to be working from home for the foreseeable future, or even more now than they ever have in the past, then the demand for a home that can handle that and doesn't necessarily have to be close to the office, you know, which is typically in an urban area, is going to continue. Uh, that being said. You know, a lot of the Fed printing money that increases the the value of assets. You know, that pushes home prices up, that pushes asset prices up. So, uh, you know, they do a lot of lip service to you know what we're doing is going to uh, lessen the gap between the haves and have-nots. But it's my expectation that if the Fed continues to be as accommodating uh, monetarily as they are, then we're actually going to see a, a great divide there. We're going to see home prices become. Uh, very, very expensive. And the people who have a home already are going to be set, you know, they're going to be gaining equity and the people who do not uh, are going to have a tough time getting into a house. Yeah, I think that uh, the whole expectation for fairly muted volatility in federal in, in uh, interest rates is similar to the expectation for muted volatility in terms of uh, the equity markets as well. Um, the average equity market return uh, from the S&P 500 on a price basis is 7.7% over the past 15, 50 years. Uh, the economist experts are now projecting 7.4%. So, uh, you know, this is a nice way of saying, 
either you know everything that's going on or you don't know anything that's going on. Um, and uh, so they tell a nice story about it and they do say that it could be front end loaded in terms of performance. And I, I would have some sympathy for that expectation. Um, but I think the big takeaway here is that as we approach 2021 and start it, uh, you gotta expect the unexpected. Um, consensus ec economists are calling for calm, um, but a, a year is a long time. And we found that out in a big way in 2020. Uh, in general, I would expect the economy to move forward fairly well. You have low interest rates, you have a good housing market, you're gonna have some stimulus spending coming up um, and you have a decent employment market. Um, but markets don't move in a straight line. So the economy is not going to move in, a, in exactly a straight line and the market's going to be even more volatile than the economy. And so I think that's something that we really need to remember and really factor in that sentiment piece as we look uh, for the prospect of equity returns in 2021, especially if that sentiment uh, lever gets a little bit too high, uh, that might be a cause for uh, taking a little bit off the table because sentiment can really front run uh, financial returns overall. And we want to close uh, with a few slides on just kind of expectations beyond 2021 now. Um, I think this is a really good opportunity for us to kind of look and kind of speculate on what's going to be the case over the next 10 years, because habits are changing. And we actually have uh, our second to last poll here. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, societal shifts. So this poll says, what societal shifts do you think are likely to be permanent? And just check all that apply here. So are you gonna be working from home? Are you gonna be exercising at home? Are you gonna be dining at home? Are you gonna be watching movies at home? Grocery shopping online? We'll give it a little longer, 10 seconds. And I'll let Andrew jump in here in five. All right, here we go. So yeah, work from home. I mean, it's something that I think we would be in agreement that that's going to be increasingly permanent. We also have people exercising at home more, uh, dining at home, uh, grocery shopping online, 47%, watch movies at home at 73%. Dine at home, yeah, I mean, selfishly, I can't wait to go back to restaurants and, and stop pretending I know how to cook. That sounds pretty great. Uh, ready to get back there. But, you know, I think the theme here is relatively consistent. There's things that, you know, a good chunk of, participants continue to expect uh, will be new trends. And we're seeing that really on COVID related spending habits. Uh, I was talking to some new clients last week that are coming on board and, you know, they're in a great spot. Their story is one that 2020 saw them not only keep their jobs, which is a huge deal given the environment that we're in, but saw rapid compensation increases. And uh, he commented to me, you know, on the phone, we're on this Zoom call, and he said, you know, it really couldn't have happened at a better time because we haven't been able to spend that money. We haven't been able to really change our lifestyle. And in a way, he's speaking specifically to some of the data that you see here. Uh, you know, in that orange box, you see cook home at home more than ordering takeout. Uh, and what's interesting there is you see young people uh, doing that significantly more than was you know, previously expected from Gen X and millennials. And you're seeing all kinds of interesting stuff. You know, young people thinking about emergency funds, people exercising at home. There's a lot of lifestyle and professional changes that have taken place. And we expect those to happen, not just on a small scale, but even on a large scale, as the next slide will show you. Um, one thing that really stands out on this next slide is uh, the percentage of people thinking about relocating. Um, that might sound odd uh, if you're, you know, older, more established, you've been in your career for a longer time, but, you know, think about the millennial generation. They're known for hopping jobs every two and a half to three years. That's a pretty consistent trend. Um, imagine that they're living in a place with a job they kind of like, but the big draw is the amenities, the things they can do socially in that area. Uh, we see here 36% of millennials thinking about moving to a different city or different state. And as, as Ben noted, when we were doing a dry run of this earlier today with the investment committee, it's staggering how many people are thinking about moving to a different country. Uh, you know, 29% of millennials say, you know what, this has made me really rethink things. We also see, uh, you know, more subtle things, you know, people looking at side hustles and looking to get, 
you know, extra income, whether because they're losing wages or they've lost their job looking for different things, uh, young people looking for more education, uh, people considering entire field changes for what they're doing. So I think there's going to be some pretty drastic impacts from this that are going to have some economic consequences, obviously, hopefully to the positive that we're going to have to digest over time. But I think some of these trends are going to continue. I think people will be looking back for a long time at COVID-19 and the economic situation that it created in 2020 and beyond and saying, yeah, this was a real pivotal time in which things changed. And we don't quite know exactly what those things will be. Uh, could be work from home, could be, hey, we had all those young people move to another country, but it's definitely something that's going to merit attention and diagnosis for years to come. So we want to talk a little bit about five ways, uh, one slide per way, uh, about thing, how things might look different. And shown here is the new Hummer electric vehicle, which hits the roads uh, in just a couple months' time. So it's, uh, it's here. Uh, the first, though, we're going to talk about is politics. We're all Keynesians now. Keynesian economics uh, came out 1920s, 1930s. Um, this was a famous quote by Milton Friedman. And uh, essentially it is, you combat recessions by spending more money and printing money. And you saw a little bit of this in uh, 2000, a lot more in 2008. And we've taken it to unprecedented heights now uh, with $2 trillion in fiscal spending, $3 trillion in printed money. And it's only going one way um, because we've seen the effects. We saw how we rebounded in employment much faster than we did before. And so we're going to keep doing this, and we're probably going to keep doing it even more uh, going into the future. And by definition, we don't know the impact, what that's going to have, if there are going to be unintended consequences, um, because we've, we're going to be doing unprecedented things from now on, as long as we have these shocks. And so I think that's one trend that's going to continue, and that's firmly cemented in uh, the body politic as it exists. Second big trend is online commerce and online gaming. Um, I think in, in uh, sports betting, uh, you're seeing the horse has kind of left the barn on that. Um, and I think that's only going to have a uh, ripple effect as neighboring states see their neighbors make more money and have more tax revenue because of the sports betting. I think that's going to be uh, a big trend going forward. But we're also seeing more direct to consumer. We saw Nike really highlighting its direct to consumer business. You have Disney Plus which actually launched Mulan uh, direct to consumer in 2020, uh, rather than into movie theaters, which is again a trend I think that's gonna continue. You have people shopping online, as we've said, uh, and even shopping online for cars. Um, so I think that's a, that's, a big, that's a big one as well. And you can see Carvana in that uh, picture below. Keeping on the car theme, uh, GM actually today had its GM Exhibit Zero and uh, if you haven't checked it out, I'd, I'd encourage you to check it out, actually. It's, it's kind of, they, they have some uh, really cool things that they're doing. And uh, the thing is, it's here. Like I said, the Hummer is coming out this year, uh, the Hummer electric vehicle. They have the Cadillac Lyric coming out next year, and then the Celestic coming out the following year in 2023. Uh, they even showed a uh, mock-up of a drone that actually carries people, vertical takeoff and landing. Um, they highlighted their self-driving capabilities. And so it's not just Tesla anymore. Uh, this thing is here, electric vehicles are here. And I wanna finish with our last poll. And that is uh, who is going to buy an electric vehicle next? Uh, so the question is my next vehicle will be an electric vehicle. Outside of the office, <laughs> we're 13%. 13 so maybe, uh, Gasoline has a few more years yet, um, at least with this audience. But, uh, you know, I think that just the fact that there's this question uh, about an electric vehicle um, is, is something to think about as we move forward. Uh, fourth thing is Brexit. We talked a little bit about this earlier. Uh, although the U UK actually left the EU on January 31st, a lot of those policies still remain in place. Now they, have, now they are officially out of the EU. And so we're gonna be talking about trade agreements and Boris Johnson is really gonna define the trade agreements for the UK for the first time since 1972. 
And that's very, very significant because the UK is such a big player in the financial industry. And, um, and uh, they're, they're going to have an impact on things. Uh, and, and this is going to be an impact not just in 2021, but much, much beyond that. So that's something we, we're going to have to pay attention to. The final piece is what uh, Andrew mentioned yes, uh, earlier, and that is the migration patterns accelerated. The yellow on the, on the left, United Van Lines puts out this national migration chart every year. The yellow are the states that are being left, and the blue are states where people are moving. And you can see uh, clearly that people are leaving California to go to the surrounding states. They're leaving the Northeast to go to the su Southeast. And uh, I think this is very significant. The other thing that's significant and perhaps one of the most important charts of the entire presentation is the one on the right. And the blue is the expectation that people were likely to move due to COVID in June. The green is the expectation that people were likely to move in November. What we tend to see in these shocks is that people have an overreaction initially, say, I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm moving, and then end up not really moving. But what's interesting here is that the green bar tends to be higher than the blue bar in almost all cases, which means that people thought about moving in June and now are really, really strongly considering it. So again, migration patterns could really impact the nature of states and the nature of the country going forward. Pulling it all back together, um, four big takeaways from this presentation. The first is the economy is not the stock market. Although the economy may move relatively uh, serenely uh, over the course of 2020 with some uh, moves up and down obviously in between related to the vaccine, uh, the markets are not gonna follow that in a straight line. There's gonna be some volatility there and that's something that we just have to uh, know ahead of time and then be prepared to take action uh, when the time uh, warrants. Second is the sentiment is elevated. It's not extreme, but sentiment is elevated both with CEOs and with investors. The third is that COVID has changed some things. Um, we're talking about migration, work from home, uh, which everybody said is a sustainable trend, e-commerce, push to electric vehicles, Brexit, they're all happening and they're gonna define a lot of the future. Um, but then there are other things that are a little bit more of a question mark and those will have to be answered over the course of the year. Those are inflation, the path of employment uh, and whether or not this labor lack of supply is a one-time issue or whether it's a, a sustained issue that's gonna stick with us for a long time and needs to be addressed. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Andrew to give us a little bit of an update on what's going on at Narwhal and uh, some things you can expect in the coming year. Thank you, Ben. Uh, you know, I, as we look at year end planning and beginning of year planning, you know, we've had probably like every company out there, you know, staff meetings and kind of consultations with employees, things like that. And, you know, I consider myself very fortunate to work at a place in which the environment has not changed. We just went through a very tumultuous, challenging year. Uh, but the three things we care about remain very constant. Uh, our internal mission statement, as well as that, that we put on our website and share with clients is that, number one, we care about investment returns. We want returns that make sense given clients' risk profiles. We want them to beat benchmarks. We want to be competitive in that space. And uh, we're going to stay disciplined on pursuing that. Secondly, we care about service. We want it to be easy to work with Narwhal, not difficult. We want to be proactive. We want to you know, hold your hand wherever possible and stay out of your way wherever necessary. And thirdly, we really care about the educational portion of what we do. I really think having studied this industry of independent advisors pretty closely for the last decade or so, I really think we're very uniquely positioned on the educational front. I would argue that some of the things we bring from an education standpoint, uh, could be every bit as valuable as what we're doing inside of portfolios. And, and this is a great example of that. These macro calls, uh, Ben spends an enormous amount of time uh, getting these ready. He spends tons of time on the morning calls. Tom is pouring through data constantly, not just so he can do his job well, but so that he can, can be communicating with clients in a broad sense and also one-on-one. -on -one. So we put a lot of emphasis on that. The whole team does. And those are the folks that were on the call today. But everybody really puts that at a premium. So we appreciate you guys being here. We really do. 
Uh, we don't say that lightly. You know, for us, it's cheesy and silly, but we care about how many people are on these calls because we view that as a read through of engagement. It means that clients care what we're thinking, not just what we're doing. It means clients, you know, continue to trust the feedback that we're bringing. And we're very, very grateful for everybody uh, that joined this call, for everybody that'll listen to it after the fact. Along those lines, I cannot encourage you enough to join our morning market briefings. Um, yes, that's self-promotion at its finest, but we put time and effort into those. You know, we're spending 10, 15, 20 minutes live on air every morning that the market is open at 8.30, and the goal of that is to benefit you all. So please, you know, join them. If you don't know how to join, go to narwhalcapital.com slash briefings. Um, we just got a client endorsement on the briefing saying it's worth the 15 minutes. You know, I hope so. That's the whole point. If it's ever not, you need to let us know. If you have questions about joining that, reach out to us. Uh, I want to tip my cap to a couple of folks that, you know, aren't on this call today in terms of content, but uh, Luke Burton, who's an accounting executive here, and Greg Moyer, who's our operations manager, have done a great job reworking our website uh, in 2020. And they've really done a great job of programming content. They've done a great job of getting everyone here uh, to give feedback, to give content so that you guys can consume it. So check that out. It's on the website. We've got a really, really capable team. And I promise you, we're not putting up fluff. We're not putting up ads. We're not putting up self-promotion. We're putting up real analysis. And I think that integration, when you combine it with the portfolio management, is really, really valuable. Um, we're continuing to build out financial planning. Uh, for those that are longstanding clients, this is somewhat new to see this really pushed. Uh, but we really got into uh, a more formal process with financial planning with Melissa Visible, who, as of about a week ago, is officially a CFP. She's got a master's in financial planning from the University of Georgia, the Harvard of the South. We're very grateful, not only for the work she's doing now, but just the legwork she's done to build the financial process. I, I said this with a client recently. I think if she knew what she was getting into, she probably wouldn't have taken the job. Um, but, you know, the greatest trick the devil ever played was convincing Melissa that it wasn't going to be that difficult. So we're really grateful to have her here. Um, and on the investment side, again, that's our core competency. It's what we're trying to do our best at. We've continu continually built out that team. We added two analysts, Jason and Vincent, uh, this summer. They're doing excellent work. That really feeds the portfolio managers and enables us to do what we do. And, and I would just encourage you as a client to say that, you know, this is really the theme for Narwhal. Um, we're on the heels of our third year of consecutive record growth in terms of new assets. Uh, from new clients. We set a record for new clients last year, record for new money uh, from existing clients. But that's not coming, I don't think, and I hope you don't think, at the expense of the client experience, whether it's portfolio management, whether it's service, whether it's education. We're continually hiring in a way that we can be ahead of client needs. So we're not watering down the product. Um, I take great encouragement in the fact that while we've seen, for us, very robust growth, uh, we had one client come in in 2020 that was not a referral. Um, our clients are coming from folks like yourselves. We're so grateful for that. We're so appreciative that you stuck with us in a really difficult 2020 uh, year. I mean, for me, when you say, hey, what was the real landmark achievement? It's that we didn't lose clients. And that's not so much a testament to us as it is a testament to you all for trusting us, for sticking with us, for believing in what we're doing. And frankly, for engaging with us on presentations like this one. So we're so grateful. Um, we all love working here. We love working at a place where the client truly comes first. Uh, we hope you see that. If you have feedback on how we can do better on any of those three key points, whether it's investment performance, service, education, please let us know. If you have things that you just feel like we're missing the mark on, get in touch with us. Um, text us, call us, email us, whatever it takes. Uh, we really want to hear from you guys. We, we really value this uh, ongoing relationship that we have with each and every one of you. And uh, we so appreciate you being here. Uh, I, one last thank you to Ben Nye and Tom Russell for doing so much on this presentation. Um, hopefully you guys see how much work goes into these things. Uh, we'll wrap it up there. We're looking forward to a great 2021 and beyond. And we appreciate you guys.
Tusk Media is a subsidiary of Narwhal Capital Management. Ratings and reviews of Tusk Media content are not to be construed as endorsements of opinions, analysis, or services offered by Tusk or its parent company. The opinions and predictions shared here are our professional beliefs at the time of publication. We are not under duress from any of the corporate entities mentioned. This is not a solicitation to take any particular action. Although we are investment advisors, this information should not be considered investment, legal, or tax advice. We strive to be as impartial, insightful, and accurate as possible. We base our opinions, analysis, and calculations on information we believe to be reliable, but we cannot guarantee its accuracy. We can, however, guarantee that our opinions will sometimes be flat out wrong due to a variety of factors. Employees and clients of Narwhal Capital Management may or may not hold positions in the securities detailed and may or may not hold these positions in the future. A a full list of all securities purchased, sold, or held during the 12 months preceding the date of this publication can be provided upon request. Unless otherwise noted, all data accessed via MarketWatch or the Bloomberg Terminal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. A copy of Narwhal's form ADV is available at the SEC's website, www.advisorinfo.sec.gov, or from Narwhal upon written request.